she's showing right now of the Luxembourg. And uh, just in the top right hand corner and hit the little blue, the little blue uh, dot and hit pin um, so that you see her image the whole time. Um, I was really worried because they were saying that there was going to be rain and maybe even thunderstorms, but uh, it's uh, warm in Paris and it's just uh, clouding over. It looks like it's a little, little windy too. So it doesn't, I think we're going to miss the rain. So poor Kate doesn't get, uh, get wet at all. So Michelle, no audio, huh? Is ever, can everybody else hear? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, sometimes my computer sometimes will do that. It'll take a bit for the audio to come in. Um, but we are going to, I think we have almost waiting for a few more people. Um, but we are actually in the um, the corner. We are in the southwest corner of the garden. It is uh, pretty huge. If you've only ventured to around the basin in the center um, in front of the palace, then uh, there is a whole lot more to this. I'm going to turn my camera off so just make sure that if you get back to mine, you know to find Kate. And uh, so we are in the corner. Um, this in the area that we are is really close to where they have an orchard, which they have um, close to 380 apple trees and 250 pear trees. And uh, they cultivate those and they also have a, um, a school, horticultural school there that the that um, students come and they study the trees and um, so it's quite it's uh, besides it being a beautiful garden it's quite the working garden which you'll see along the way. So we'll go ahead and um, get started. We'll have those other people pop in here. But this is uh, this this here this statue, and we started with him because we mentioned him a couple weeks ago, and he will also come up to, in tomorrow's episode of La V Creative Paris History of uh, Hemingway. Um, this is the statue of Charles Augustin Saint Beuve, and he was an author and a critic. He was close friends with Victor Hugo until he started having an affair with Victor Hugo's wife, Adele. So, you know, they put a little, uh, re you know, a little uh, kink in their friendship. Um, but uh, if you listen to the podcast tomorrow, it's about Juliet Drouet, and she was the longtime mistress of Victor Hugo. And so once Victor started up with Juliet and Adele was uh, with uh, Saint-Bove, they decided to kind of have a little bit more of an open marriage. So he um, he was an interesting guy. He we actually passed. Uh, he used to live on the Cour de Commerce Saint Andre, which is what we did the walk a couple weeks ago, um, two weeks ago I think, when we went to Odeon. So he uh, he kind of comes up here um, uh, late a lot lately. It's I love how all of these people kind of intersect. Um, and we're going to keep going. Um, I had I sent I could show you at the end of this the map that I sent to Kate <laughs> with all of my uh, lines of like okay and then you walk here they'd walk there um, and uh, she figured it all out she's a pro but it was pretty funny I thought this anybody gonna understand this but me so this um, to the left of us we have this uh, really beautiful building it's the Pavillon Devil. And this was, um, it's named after the architect, Gabriel Devo, and it was designed, um, and he also had de designed the building that once stood at the Trocadero. If you've seen the amazing pictures, that was the building that, that was created for the Universal Expedition, Exposition, um, he designed that and it has long been destroyed. Uh, but he designed this building, this building at first when it opened, um, it was a little uh, cafe, a little restaurant. How beautiful is that? And then it ended up uh, after some time it turned into it's part of the beekeeping school, which we're going to see here in a few minutes. Um, and so it was uh, beekeeping and horticulture in the summer. They do open it up and they have uh, different um, art events there. And so it's uh if you go in there and if you're there in the summer just peek by this because maybe you could get a get a shot inside um they do lectures and everything in there but is it it's just like the tile work and everything is just such a beautiful building but he also um the same architect also did the um fontaine saint michel which is wonderful 
this uh, the statue you see um, over there, that's the Joie de la Famille, um, so fitting for today. Um, it was originally titled Happiness, and it was shown in the 1889 um, Salon. Some of these, because we can't go on the grass, um, it's uh, some of them you have to get from different sides, but this one is um, really beautiful, really beautiful uh, statue and has all those um, lovely flowers. The flowers of the garden, they will sometimes change these out overnight. So it looks like maybe they are about to because they're not, uh, there's not a lot of flowers going on right now. <laughs> but right here, um, this is, uh, I know Reg was, Reg was excited about seeing this. This is the um, oldest beekeeping school in, in uh, France. And it was created in 1856 by a, a guy named Henry Ramey. And uh, he um, was fascinated with bees and decided, you know, that people need to know how to take care of them. So they have over 17 um, um, hives here in the garden. And they actually will teach people how to be beekeepers. And if you uh, remember after the fire of Notre Dame, they were saying how luckily the hives that were on top of Notre Dame were saved, they were fine. There's hives on uh, the top of the um, Gallery Lafayette, the Palais Garnier that we saw the other day. So most of those people all had come through this school and learn how to do it. Um, one of the really cool things I found, and I can't wait to go get this, but they, every year in September on one day, which is also the day of the Patrimon, they actually sell the honey in the orangerie that we'll see today as well. Um, so I'm pretty, there it is right there. September 19th, 2020. Thank you, Kate. Got that on my calendar. Um, but they actually sell it. And so I can't wait to go and buy some of the honey, but I'm so weird. I will just, I'll barely want to use it because I want to save it. And then it just, you know, then it just goes bad. So, uh, but the, the Fête de Mille um, is uh, something they didn't do it last year. They haven't done it since 2019, of course, uh, but that's pretty cool that they, um, that they sell the honey and you have to, you have to imagine those are the happiest bees in all of Paris. They love the fact that they're right next to the orchards um that and so in 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 france they have a ban on um, pesticides so because of the bees and because of the different um birds and animals and so they uh they're very happy bees compared to probably the ones we have here so this if you know of um of a bocce bocce ball um this is uh or patonk depending on what you want to call it these are some courts here in the garden. Now, if you are just in Paris and you think maybe it's fun to go check it out and learn how to play it, this is not the place for you. <laughs> These are like the hardcore experts that play here. They have boxes over on the side where they could go and lock up their um, their um, petanque balls and leave their things. Um, and these people come here obviously just to sit and watch them. But these are like these are like the hardcore. Um, they have been playing this for their whole life, and uh, it's pretty. It's actually really fun to sit there and watch them. It's really interesting. Um, but yeah, this isn't it. You know, this isn't the. You know, I'm in next kind of a kind of a game that's uh, if you're going to take it up that's not where to start but it is pretty fun to watch it and these chairs we'll get to these chairs later but i there's nothing better than those chairs and one of my very favorite sounds is the sound of those green chairs scraping along the uh the gravel that um statue there is of our Archidilus, which is, um, he is, you can't, it's kind of hard to see on some of them, but he's holding two discs and uh, it's an old uh, Greek mythology, which uh, you'll see a lot in here. Um, this one right here, of course, is uh, Chopin, which uh, who doesn't love a little uh, Chopin? The, uh, you know, he is here and then his, uh, one of his ex loves is also in the garden, which we will see later on. Uh, but this actually um, was debuted at the 50th anniversary anniversary of his death. Uh, 
And the original bust was actually then removed and it was sent to Poland because he, he, that's where he's from. And in 19, um, and that happened in 1929. In 1942, a bronze replacement was added um, just in uh, time for them to melt it down. The Vichy government melted it down. And then they ended up putting up another, uh, there's a cop that the one that's there now is a copy. Um, but Poland had sent, sent to Paris one and then it came back. Those, uh, hopefully those clouds kind of stay away. You aren't, uh, of course, allowed to walk on the grass and uh, you can at the upper part or the what they call the lower part of the garden, um, but you can't get on the grass in this part. Um, I sometimes do see some people, you know, hopping on over there and I won't say that I have maybe done that once or twice to get a picture of a fountain, but I'm scared to death every time I do it. <laughs> um, oh, we have some little kids coming up. This is, of course, I don't think she needs, she needs no introduction, of course. This is, um, of course, um, what they know, Liberty Lighting the World. We call her the Statue of Liberty. This is a uh, this one, um, the original was created in 1884. The, that one is out now in the Musée d'Orsay. This is a, um, a copy of one that was later added. This one um, was given um, to the garden actually by Bartoli, who was the sculpture of it, of course. And uh, he gave it to the Musée de Luxembourg and originally it sat closer to the gate of the Musée de Luxembourg. And in 1905, it was placed, um, it was placed over here. And so it, it moved, it's moved a few times, which some of the statues in the garden actually have done. On her tablet, which is a little bit different than what you see in, in the one in, in New York, this one has a date of November 15th, 1889 on it instead of July 4th. Um, that was the year that the large one that's in um, Paris on the Seine was actually inaugurated. So most of the ones you see in Paris all have that November date on it, um, which is different from the one that's in um, New York. And next to the tree, next to it is a tree and there's a plaque down below. It's an American oak tree. It was dedicated to the victims of 9-11 um, and it was a gift from the American community in Paris they gave to, they gave to Paris. Um, and so that tree, uh, the tree is getting getting a little bit bigger all the time. It was dedicated and planted in 2002. Um, when Hemingway, after his marriage with Hadley ended, um, he wasn't religious and he had would come here, walk through the garden when he needed a moment. Um, visiting the Statue of Liberty was for him uh, like a Catholic visiting their favorite saint. He would come to see uh, the Statue of Liberty and maybe have a little moment when he thought, Maybe he should go back to the U.S. and uh, you know give up this dream in France. Um, but he would go up, go always come through the park and go visit her. They lived just down the street, um, which we'll uh, we'll do it on another walk someday. Um, but they, he uh, and Pauline live very close by, so he he's always lived close by to the Luxembourg. Maybe that's why I feel like I need to be so close to it. But he would come here and visit it and kind of pray to her because he wasn't that religious. But it is, pretty, yeah, the original one that was in the park is now in the Orsay. Um, and then there's, of course, there's two of them at the um, the Musée des, um, des Arts Métiers. There's one inside and one outside. The one inside is actually his original model that he did. Of course, you, there's always lots of people running and walking and sitting. Nothing's better than uh, pulling up a chair in the Luxembourg, and you'll see um, there's people that take a couple chairs so they could put their feet up um, and sit back. There's a whole thing about the chairs and the three different um, three different models, which we'll show you. We'll tell you the funny little story about that. And there should be, is there this? Yep, this is the one. So this is honestly, I think one of the funniest statues in, 
the garden. And the first time you see it, you're like, wow, is this guy like, is he having a really good time or is there really something wrong here? So this um, statue is called the, tri um, the Triumph of Silence is what it translates to. It's by Jules Delo, who um, did a couple, he did another uh, uh, fantastic uh, monument here in the park dedicated to one of my favorite artists um, who's kind of all over the park. But this is, um, this is the drunken sil silence is is a image in art that goes back centuries and centuries. It um it around the, if we go around to the um keep going up you'll see. Oops, <laughs> you can see now you can see there's this uh, gentleman in the in the top, and he is uh he you'll see he does he look like he's uh had too much to drink and they're actually pushing him up to get him on top of this donkey and it was uh purchased in 1855 and it was placed into the park not until 1897 when it was created in bronze um uh, by it's uh he's related to the god of dionysus who is also what you would also call bacchus who is the god of wine and you could definitely tell that he's had a lot of wine. There's people like, uh, you know, falling underneath the donkey. They're trying to push him up. Um, I don't know. If, I don't think the people that are pushing him up are look like they're having as good of a time as he is. <laughs> uh, but it is a it's a pretty uh, it's a pretty funny uh, statue. And it gets definitely gets a lot of people um, stopping and looking at it. It's pretty phenomenal if you look at it um, from all sides. This is one of those ones that, you know, you could uh, maybe hop on the grass. You don't have to do that, Kate, but maybe hop on the grass and take a little uh, shot because you could see the back of the donkey, the back of his legs. Um, you could really definitely check out all the sides of this one. There's just so many people there, it's so fantastic. They were building this, um, what looks to be like a temporary structure, I noticed, but it doesn't look so temporary now. We'll, we'll check it out as we go. But the gardeners here um, are amazing. I was able to go, um, I was really lucky that I was able to go with some of the gardeners into one of the gardens where they keep everything. Um, and it's just like greenhouse after greenhouse of orchids and and tulips and everything that they they curate for the garden. Um, the car garden usually always looks like it's in bloom because it is, um, it, they will basically, you could go there one day and you're sitting there around, uh, you know, the, in front of the um, palace and every, all the flowers are like, you know, pinks and colors like that. And then all of a sudden you come the next day and everything's oranges and they will literally go in overnight and uh, pull everything up and replace it. So the garden pretty much always looks like it's in pristine condition. Oh, so that building kind of swore, got in the way of our path. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is. They were putting it up, but it doesn't look, uh, doesn't look so temporary now. We'll find, we'll have to find out what it was. This uh, this statue right here is of um, this fantastic author that if you um, he has written one of the very best books that there ever was about Marie Antoinette. It's uh, Stefan Zig. He um, lived it came to Paris and he was a one of the most popular authors of his time. Um, this was at this wasn't added to the garden until two thousand three. He was originally from Austria, um, but he was um, popular around the world in the 1920s and 30s. His books have been translated into many different languages. Um, he wrote this fantastic book about Marie Antoinette. If there's one book you're going to read about her, that should be the one. Um, he's also written ones about Mary Stewart and Paul Verlaine, who, which we will also see on this um, uh, today. We'll see a statue to him, uh, but he is a, the Marie Antoinette book was really great. It, it definitely is not written. Um, most books all talk about, you know, the, you know, how she ruined everything in France and the fall of the monarchy, <clears throat> but he has a little bit more of a sympathetic, interesting take on it, um, which is really, it, it, which is really nice. So 
this statue here <clears throat> is um, of Beethoven. And if you have been to, um, there's a small museum in Paris called the um, Musée Bordel, <clears throat> excuse me, he, um, it, which is a really, it's really close to the Montparnasse uh, train station. It's a smaller museum. It's uh, free unless they have a special exhibit in there, but it's one to definitely go and check out. It's really interesting. He was obsessed with uh, sculpting the, um, the bust and the head of Beethoven. He created over 35 different pieces and he there you can see all of them in um, the museum. It's really interesting to see the transition that he had um, over time. He, it's, uh, he elaborated a little on some of them, <clears throat> but they are all really interesting. Um, it's a really cool, uh, hey, get off the grass, kid. Um, it's a really interesting uh, museum to go check out. If you watched this before when we, we uh, did the Medici, I told you about how I was told um, to hide before you leave, to go and put um, three coins, dig a little hole and put three coins and it, um, it signifies you're returning to France. And right around here is another one of those places that I did that. <laughs> You have to be kind of sneaky because I don't think the gardeners want you to just start digging into the grass. So um, I always, and I'm always just terrified I'm going to get caught. Um, this is another really cool um, statue. It's um, kind of hard to see. You could kind of see him in the middle. It's called Le Four Effort, and um, it was done by Pierre Rocher. Um, Rocher um, took his name because he always sculpted things out of marble and he always uh, used added rocks into the whole scene. This it was uh, basically it's Hercules. Um, he represents one of the 12 laborers that was um, supposed to clean the um, Asian uh, stables. Hercules is in bronze and then he's actually on the rocks and the rocks um, it's all representing that he is um, kind of bending down and trying to stop uh, trying to divert the water from the river to help him clean the stables. Um, it was originally planned to be a fountain, so it would make a little bit more sense, but um, because of cost and how expensive it was going to be, um, the, the Senate, which is, um, the Senate actually is uh, in the Palais de Luxembourg now, they are the ones that oversee the garden too. And they decided against that because it was just going to be way too expensive. I can't imagine, can you imagine how much it costs to keep this? keep this going and because everything's so meticulously taken care of and th this garden is huge. Um, and there's just so much we're not even going into the center where you have uh, even more things. So this building here on the left is the orangerie. This is um, a really cool building that inside um, they hold all the trees. There's usually over 150 different trees in these fancy boxes, um, including the palm trees, they keep them there throughout the year, but in the the late spring and summer months, they actually will open it up and have exhibits. And this is where they're going to sell the honey. So up on the building, this was constructed in 1888. It replaced a former orangery that was here. Um, this is up on the building. You see those little bus, um, and those bus all are um, artists. And I will uh, after this, I will write up a whole big thing and put it on the Facebook event. Um, I was trying to figure out a way to actually email that to everybody, but um, I don't think it captures your email, um, but I will actually list out who each and every one of these are. It's really cool how they did it. They did it um, kind of in order of basically when these artists, like where they fit in time. There's Francois Rude, Paul Proudhon, um, David Danger, um, Angre is in there, and of course, my favorite, Delacroix. Uh, but it's really interesting because it's, um, it's I usually sometimes, they just, you know, there's the statues on the Hotel de Ville and the statues at the outside, the Louvre, um, which some, they do somewhat, you know, there's a rhyme and reason to some of them. Um, but this is really cool because it'll be also this one inspired this one. Some of those artists actually have work that's air in the garden or it has um, work dedicated to them as well. And then on either end of them, there's another, um, there's statues. This one is the one dedicated to painting. Um, she um, replaced a statue that was there originally dedicated to victory. Um, but this is also right on the other side of this building. If we could hop over this building, we would be at the Musée de Luxembourg. 
So it all kind of makes sense that they are all uh, all the artists. Most of, if you've noticed, most of the statues, uh, you know, they're dedicated to authors and artists um, here in France. And we're coming up to one of my favorite ones. Everybody get excited. The statue coming up here is of the monument to Eugène Delacroix. La Grege, I like that. Are you cheering on all the good people running or Delacroix? <laughs> but this one, um, I, I don't, every time I see this one, I always like smile. I have these weird things. If you've like, when I go see, uh, when I see the giant, amazing portrait of Napoleon and his coronation, I always just smile like I'm visiting an old friend. But this, uh, this amazing uh, monument fountain um, is dedicated, of course, to Eugène Delacroix. It's by Jules Dallot, who also did, oh no, hang on, um, who also did the, the drunk guy and the donkey. <laughs> but this one um, was uh, after he had died, um, 17 years after his death he, um, in 1880, his admirers and, and fans um, ended up getting enough money together that they wanted to have this monument built to him. He, of course, the, you know, we're very close to Saint-Sulpice. We're also very close to his um, former home, which is now the Musée Delacroix. Um, but uh, they created this and at the very top, you see him kind of as the younger, younger man um, with uh, his a scarf around his neck and a bust. And then underneath it, you have um, on the left, you have um, you have time. It's actually, you know, old man time there with the wings. He's holding up glory and she's reaching up there to put some flowers below, um, below Delacroix. Um, which is kind of lovely is a little a little ode to him. And then um, on the right hand side, where you see the um, the other allegory, he is actually clap looks like he's clapping for him. So it's a it's a really lovely, wonderful piece. Um, and really, you know, it's it just really, you know, emphasizes how his admirers adored him. He was the leader of the romantic um, movement, of course, and he did one of my very favorite um, Liberty Leading the People um, portraits. It's in the Louvre as, as well as everything else. Um, it also has those little masks, masks um, that are on the side where the water comes out. And when you go there, just take a look at them because each one of them is just a little bit different. But that was actually um, unveiled finally in 1890. So it's been there for a very long time. Most of everything in the garden, when Marie de Medici, when she purchased, um, took over this uh, piece of uh, Paris, it was not the size it is now. It definitely grew um, mostly um, a lot, somewhat out under Hausmann. He ended up uh, making it a little larger. And then um, Louis the 18th um, <clears throat> and Louis Philippe added a lot to this. So it definitely is much larger than it was um, when Marie um, de Medici originally had it. And now on the up, we're gonna head up here to this little upper terrace. <clears throat> so we're gonna come across a whole bunch of statues um, to the, <clears throat> there's 20 of them, dedicated to the 20 illustrious women of France. And these were installed in uh, <clears throat> around the 1880s as well, or 1860s, I'm sorry. And um, it was Louis Philippe that actually decided on which ones um, were going to be placed. So some of them, um, you know, some of them are, you know, Marie de Medici is one of them. This is Saint Clotilde. Um, she was the wife of Clovis. And uh, she was actually a very good friends with Saint Jean Viev, who is another lady on the other side of the um, terrace. But Saint Jean Viev, if it wasn't for um, Saint Clotilde, um, which is what Spellcheck always thinks my name is, is Clotilde. Um, she actually, we wouldn't know anything about Saint Jean Viev. She she was friends with her, and as soon as uh, Saint, she outlived Saint Jean Viev, and she started writing her story and published and had it published, and was um, instrumental in her reaching um, uh, sainthood. So. She, um, but there's a, I did a whole video, which I will actually, I did it um, <clears throat> a month or two ago, all about the 20 of the women. 
and each of their stories. And I will go ahead and um, I'll post that as a little special thing for you guys. You guys can watch it. I basically give the story of every single one of them. <clears throat> um, so there's uh, Marguerite de Provence. She was um, a beautiful, uh, lovely lit girl that Blanche de Castille, which is the mother of Louis the IX, uh, thought that she'd be the perfect match for her son. Um, but then Blanche de Castille was uh, a little uh, overbearing, didn't really love the fact that uh, Marguerite and Louis the IX were so close. She wanted to be the only woman in her life. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> And Anne de Breton, she was a wife of Charles VIII and Louis XII. She was married to Charles VIII um, and he, it was stipulated in her marriage contract that if he died, she had to marry his successor. And so when he, Charles died a few years later and uh, Louis, Louis XII was already married. And so she thought she was out of it, but they actually had the uh, wedding annulled and she ended up having to marry him. That's not so good thing we've gotten past some of those customs, right? But we're just on the upper side and there's always more and more chairs everywhere you look in the palace. Um, these are the great places. Uh, Reg, I loved your picture of uh, the woman sunning herself on the chairs. I have a, a very similar one of a gentleman sitting up here um, that was, his skin was probably close to leather. It was so tan um, sitting up here uh, sunning himself. But, you know, it's uh, when the sun comes out in Paris, so does everybody looking to grab that sun as much as they can. This is um, Anne, Anne d'Autriche, Anne of Austria, who was, of course, the mother of uh, Louis the Fourteenth. She was the wife of Louis the Thirteenth. Um, she was very dedicated to the church, um, and after years and years of her still not uh, producing an heir, she um, dedicated uh, and had the Val de Grasse church built, which is close to here, which we'll have to go check out because that area is really beautiful. Um, she ended up uh, saying, if I build this, you know, all I want is to be able to have a son, and so right after that, she ended up uh, getting becoming pregnant. <clears throat> So it worked, it worked for her. It's really fun to watch them if you're there um, during the changes kind of of the seasons and they move out those uh, boxes. They um, have to change them out repeatedly because they, you know, if they start to rot or, um, or the trees just outgrow them, they have to, and they keep constantly pruning them. Here we have a uh, Blanche de Castile. She's the overbearing mother of Louis the Ninth, <laughs> who definitely just wanted to uh, have uh, have her son all to herself. Um, these uh, of all of these statues, there is one that used to be here that is um, now in the Musée de Louvre, which is the one of Joan of Arc, and we actually. Um, if you listen to the podcast episode where I did about the ladies of the Louvre, where we talked about um, Wing Victory and the Mona Lisa and Venus de Milo, I'm going to do another one and we're going to talk about the Joan of Arc statue and also um, Delacroix's Liberty, Liberty Leading the People. I can't not pass up a reason to talk about that painting. And also the um, Coronation of Napoleon. So two epic, epic paintings that are there in the Louvre. Um, this is Anne de Bajou. She um, served as the regent um, for her brother. Um, when, uh, when her father died, her um, Louis XI, he, um, he, he said that she needed to serve as the regent over her brother because he was a feeble mind. <laughs> so she served as regent and uh, she did a lot um, she did a lot and she was, the people, the people absolutely loved her. It's a little overcast, it's very warm. This, this one is uh, another one that I just really love. And also just because of uh, her name, her name is Valent Valentine de Milan. And uh, you got the horse chestnut trees back there just 
moving around. She was born in Milan, of course. She was married to Louis the First, who was the Duke of Duke de Orléans. He was killed on the streets um, of Paris on the Rue Saint Antoine. We actually, if uh, you remember, when we did the Marais Walk and we checked out a bunch of the different museums. That was uh, that we actually walked right by where it was. He was killed by the orders of his cousin, Jean Sanper. Um, and then she was trying to do everything she could to get justice for her husband, and she died the next year. Um, but it's interesting, you know, you don't expect to see a Italian there. So, Kate, if you could just kind of walk over to the top of those steps right behind you. Did she get that? And then look down. On the on the just at the very top, look uh, look down to where your feet are, and there should be those brass. Do you see the brass markers to the left? Or there's one to the left of you and one to the right. There we go. So these are the Arago markers. There's two of them right here. Um, these are the markers that go through Paris. If you read or watch the Da Vinci Code, you know of these. Um, they actually have nothing to do with the Da Vinci Code. But these Arago markers were, um, they just go back to 1994. They were put in place um, by the Arago Association who created, who commissioned an artist named Jean Dibay to create these. Um, and they're dedicated to Francois Arago. He, um, it, they started the observatory, which is um, up above, down below. I always want to call this above, but because we're south, it's down below. Um, and they run all the way through Paris on the um, Meridian Line, the original Meridian Line. And they actually go through the Louvre. So you actually have a bunch of these that you could find inside the Louvre, which is really cool. Um, of course, in the Da Vinci Code, they talked about these being the Rose Line and um, some of the ones in the museum um, don't watch the movie and then drop down the location and think you're going to find them in Paris. They had added a few of them that aren't really there. Over time, though, some people have, um, they've been moved because of construction. They've also been stolen. So sometimes um, I actually have, I found on the internet because I'm a nerd and uh, found basically the location of every one of them that's there and um, I have not followed the path of them, but I always keep an eye out, especially when you could find them in the Palais Royal. If once you kind of figure out the line that they're going, you just kind of keep an eye on them. It's pretty uh, easy to figure out. And then, of course, we have here the Grand Dame of her garden, Marie de Medici. She stands here. Um, there's no Catherine here. There's just Marie. Uh, Marie de Medici, of course, the second wife of Henry IV. And this is her garden that she gets to overlook every single day and enjoy, hopefully. I was there one time and I heard there was two Americans taking pictures and there was like, Marie de Medici, who's that? I thought there was Catherine. And I stood there for a minute taking a picture and then I um, jumped in and gave them a little history lesson on the difference of Catherine and, and Marie de Medici and what they did. Marie is, our, of course, the Luxembourg, and Catherine is more the Tuileries and, you know, witchcraft and St. Bartholomew Day Massacre. <laughs> um, this, this one here is a woman. Her name is Laura de Nove. She may or may not be a real person. So there's another one in the garden that definitely is not a real person, which is really fun and interesting of how they made the cut of the 20. I would love to know. Um, I even have a book all in Fran French about these ladies, and it doesn't really say, you know, exactly why this one or that one was chosen. Um, but this, um, she was, um, but as much as we know about the maybe real person was that she was born in 1310. Um, a poet actually saw her in a church and thought she was fascinating and beautiful. And so he would actually follow her around for a few months, sounds a little strange. He would follow her around, but he would write these poems and he wrote these poems for like 15 or 20 years. And so this legend of who she was just became bigger and bigger um, as her, the poems were discovered. And nothing is known of her other than the fact of when she was born and that he saw her in a church and then that is it. So it's uh, pretty interesting. And this is a, there's a bunch of little stands in here where you could go get um, an expensive uh, coffee or a Coke or even a crepe. 
in the middle of the day. Um, there's little ones here. There's also um, a restaurant that you could get um, other things that you could get. You're not, you know, they say you're not supposed to be drinking in the park, but everybody does it. And then this is a fantastic view. Usually there's all, all along that base where you see those chairs in front of you are flowers. So I think they must be uh, getting ready to put them in. Um, and so it's always fun to see what color they pick. In the very center of there, it's kind of hard to see. There's a statue of um, Diane. Um, Diane Edebish, um, it's Diane and the um, deer. Oh, look, at Kate's gonna take us right down there. Um, it's Diane and the deer, and it's a copy of the one that's basically the Diane, uh, Diane de Versailles. Oh, there's, so, there's some plants in there. Um, there's usually just like the tall tulips and everything else. So those will probably be coming. Um, but it's a copy of the Diane of um, Versailles, which was one of the most beloved statues that Versailles had that um, of Louis the 14th. He absolutely loved this one. She, of course, is a very popular um, image that's used in art, um, especially in France. Um, Diane de Poitiers, of course, adopted her. Henry II absolutely loved um, Diane. I remember watching the funeral of Princess Diana. I think that was what I first realized because they said how Diane, Diana the Huntress. So I always think of that. I think I see some little rain. Are those raindrops or are those flowers? Uh-oh. It looks like we there's have a full storm going on, I'm afraid. Uh oh, <laughs> yeah, but it's okay though. It's still warm. <laughs> and it looks like um, we can't get up there. We can't, I'm afraid there's barriers. I just put them here. Um, um, I'm trying to clear the park from the storm because it's really oh. dusty. Oh, they are. Uh oh, yeah, but we'll run around until they tell us to stop. Yeah, well, we'll head back there and you can hide behind the Medici fountain, hopefully. Yeah. But the exactly. statues up here on the top, those are uh, more. There's a Louis de Savoy who was, um, and I could put, put, I'll send you guys the other videos so you could check all those out. She um, was the mother of Francis, Francois Premier. Um, she was in love with Italian Renaissance. And a lot of people have always uh, think that Catherine de Medici was the one who brought the forks and silverware to France, but it was actually um, Louis, Louise de Savoy who did that because she was in love with the Renaissance and, uh, and um, would bring all those to Paris. And then of course we have the pond here where there's no sweet little boats moving around here. Um, the basin, um, which I love the story of the boats, the basin itself was, um, is the big basin here. There are the boats. I see them on the left, I think. That little kid, they're probably saying no boats. They're just the sweetest things ever. So these boats actually appeared in 1927. And there was a man named Clement um, Podo who was um, had a, a small store where he would sell these little boats. And so he had this idea of um, using, selling, you know, renting them and selling them to people to use in the pond, the different um, ponds and the different um, fountains around Paris. So he contacted the Senate and he asked them if he could um, and they let him. And then, um, so the boats that you see today are the, still the same boats from 1927. I mean, I'm sure that some of them have um, been uh, replaced over time, but the boats, most of them themselves, the, his wife would, would sew the sails uh, for each one of them. And his son took over after he died um, but you could also find the boats in the Tuileries as well. Um, it's really it's really cute to sit there and watch um, the little kids. They come with these big sticks, so they kind of push them along. Um, and they have different countries on it. And there's oh, there's also one that's a pirate ship, so it has black sails with a skull on it. And and that is one you always see the kids kind of fight over to get. Is it good? Hopefully, uh, Hopefully there's no lightning or thunder. Be very, be safe, Kate. Um, but the chairs themselves, um, the chairs, there's three different shapes of the chairs. You see the one, um, there's one with arms, there's ones without arms, and then there's the ones that lean um, way back. And author David Downey um, wrote this really great book called Paris, Paris. And he spent an entire day in the garden and he just watched everybody. And by the end of it, he said he could pick out people and which chair they would go to just it, it was easy to spot like that person's going to be the laid back chair that person's going to be the armchair 
now nowadays it's kind of it fits the peak season and uh, you're just lucky for any chair so it's not as much um i like the ones with the arm chairs the ones that lean back or almost lean back too far unless you want to take you know a little nap uh, but those chairs are um they've been a part of the garden they originally the chairs that were here you'd have to actually rent them um and uh are they gonna let you sneak over to the when we get to the very maybe we want to see if we get to the back of the medicine yeah. fountain i think that i think they're preparing to film something because they just blocked all of this off since i did my walk around oh and now there's like uh mobile tv studios oh goodness so, well and one of my some of my we'll we'll do another part where we hit this part this side of the whole garden um because there's another one of my favorite fountains or statues over there um but the chairs themselves they're actually called the luxembourg chairs so even when you see them in the twilleries they're the luxembourg chairs they um they were da they date back um to when my grandfather my grandparents went there in the 70s they have pictures of different chairs that look a little less comfortable um but these ones are the official they actually call them the senate chairs um but they are really there's nothing better than hearing those sliding across the are those people all hiding in there um sliding across the little gravel that also the little gravel beware it has a way of finding its way inside your shoe and you know it's always one of those things where the you know the princess and the pea where <laughs> the uh the tiniest tiniest piece of gravel feels like you're walking on a boulder in your shoe these, this is another one of the little uh, cafes that you could get stuff at. There's also those music pavilions. It's really fun. They do a lot of times have um, musicians that are playing in there. Looks like all these are a whole bunch of new trees planted this year. I just was reading um, one of the uh, one of the uh, fountain or one of the statues in the in the park um, was created, uh, who, the gentleman that created it also created, basically designed all of the benches in our Paris. So I'm gonna have something about that coming up soon on my um, on my Instagram, check that out. <coughs> Usually they kick you all out, they kick everybody out before sunset. Um, it's never open for sunrise or sunset. It's always right after that. Um, but this is a little early, probably because of the storm. <laughs> it's the storm, Sarah. There's like those little dust tornadoes. They get. Look, now we have the whole thing to ourselves. <laughs> exactly. It's great. <laughs> it's been like a whole year of Paris to myself. I know. Perfect. I'm very spoiled. This is um, right out in front of us. That's the Rue de Medici. And then straight above that is um, the Pantheon. So to give you kind of a frame of reference of where we are, all the way on the other side, you see on the fence, there's those black um, black uh, rectangles. They always have um, from the outside, they do these different uh, photo exhibits, which is really interesting. Sometimes they showcase different areas of France um, and they just kind of, it's uh, they change them out every once in a while. It's kind of cool. Also in this area is, uh, the statue of Georges Saint. I like the diehards that aren't moving. They're just like, we're not going anywhere. We could go back and kind of get, head towards the back of the, um, the back of the Medici fountain. Yeah. In the center of this, this is really cool. And if um, from the other end, it's such a really awesome perspective. Um, there's the two two statues on either end here. We'll walk past this one. This is the dancing fawn. Um, and on the very far other opposite end is the Greek actor. Um, but the dancing fawn should be hanging out with our guy that's trying to get up on the donkey. He's dancing on um, this bag that is um, basically filled with wine. But if you uh, on a sunny day, you could this is um, I posted this picture um just on my instagram the other day and it's uh if you go check it out it's cloudy and blue blanc rouge but you could it's cool to see what the pattern of the flowers were underneath they actually did this like kind of swirling pattern 
um, that's really neat compared to what they have today. Um, but the there's the dancing fawn and the Greek actors on the other side. And you can see the palace, of course. Um, if you uh, now that with uh, the hope of everything, you know, the June 9th is the date the president said of uh, France that the tour tourists outside the EU would be welcome back. Um, I will be there September and October. Um, and um, that is when they do the Patron weekend, which is my favorite. It's the third weekend. And it's also when they're selling the honey. So if you're going to go to Paris, um, come then. And I will definitely be, oh, yes, Don, Don and Carol. I'll tell that story, Don. Um, so on the back of the fountain, this is what is kind of the secret fountain of the Medici. Look at how clean it is. It's too clean, way too clean. Uh, <clears throat> But this on the back of the fountain, hopefully she's still there. She is still there. This is um, the the <clears throat> fountain of, uh, excuse me, it's Lita and the Swan. And Lita, this was a fountain that was actually located in another place in the city. And it was, um, <clears throat> it was just down, not too far from here. And it was put in place under Napoleon when he, they actually put a fountain in there where they were trying to bring more water to the city, uh, to the people of Paris. So they, but they decided under Hausman who was going through and just, you know, taking out, um, you know, tons of houses and homes and to make these grand vistas and stuff that we actually know and love of Paris today. Um, but he was actually going to destroy this fountain. So um, another architect and artist actually said wanted to save it. So he was able to save it um, and from being destroyed, Gabriel Davio, and he um, had held on to it. Well, at the same time, right after that, um, they the Medici fountain itself um, is actually used to be about 100 feet behind Kate. Um, from where it is today. And they he was going to remove it um, because they were making the Rue de Medici and that um, avenue behind us. So they actually took the fountain apart stone by stone, which is just crazy to think about and put it back together over here, a hundred feet away. So when they did this, they thought, oh, well, hey, here's this perfect place to put this, uh, this fountain. And it's Lita and the Swan. And Lita in the Swan is a, another very popular depiction that they've used in art for centuries and sent going back to Greek times. <clears throat> and she is, um, Zeus um, was uh, enamored by her and how beautiful he was, but um, mere mortals were not, could not see him in the form of, of, of him as a god. So he had to, uh, turn himself into an animal. And he's done this when he's turned himself into a bull. There's quite a few stories, but he turned himself into a swan and he seduced Lita. And some of the pictures get pretty hot and steamy. <laughs> some of the paintings they do. This one's a little bit more tame, um, but he ended up seducing her. She became pregnant. She also had slept with her husband on the same day and became pregnant um, as well from him. So she became pregnant. She ended up um, months later giving birth to two eggs and inside the eggs were two children. Yes, this is, it's very believable, right? <laughs> and she ended up giving birth to two children that belonged to Zeus and two children that belonged to her husband. Um, usually they always, uh, in art, they always just depict it as Lita and the swan. And sometimes he's getting pretty frisky, um, but they put it back <clears throat> excuse me, on the back of the fountain. You could kind of see in that, uh-oh, we lost Kate. Um, you could see there, hopefully she'll pop back on here. Her phone was doing something strange before we started. Um, but uh, I'll tell Don and Carol, I'll tell your story. So Don and Carol told me that uh, they went to Paris and they wanted to go look at the Medici fountain and they were so excited to find it, but they only found the back of it. They didn't see the front of it. <laughs> Which is funny because um, it's uh, the back of it is what more, most people actually don't see. Um, so hopefully, let's see, hopefully Kate comes back on here. 
I'll turn my video back on so you're not sitting here in the dark. Um, but the uh, Medici fountain, of course, is pretty um, fantastic. And they are cleaning it, as we saw a few weeks ago. And you can see today how white it is. Um, it's too white. It's too clean. Um, so hopefully they'll, uh, you know, moss it up or it'll get a little green quickly. Um, and hopefully we didn't, we might have just completely lost Kate. Hopefully, uh, hopefully they didn't nab her and kick her out of the garden. Um, but that was actually kind of, we'll see if we'll give her another minute um, to see if she comes back on. Um, and if anybody has any questions or anything, if you want, um, if there's some walks that you want to see, I ha actually have a, the next few weeks already planned out, um, but we could also change those. One of those is um, one that I know Carol and Dawn really want to see. So we'll leave that a surprise until, you know, later today, not that long. Um, but if there's any place that you guys are dying to see, um, uh, let me know. There's a part of Paris that you're missing. Um, and hopefully with the news of uh, letting people back in, you guys are going to plan a little trip sometime soon to get back there. I kind of think maybe we lost Kate. She's probably trying to frantically figure out what happened. Hopefully she didn't. It wasn't the rain. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Yes, it's, uh, I mean, we've been great to have a little bit of sunshine, but that's okay. And we'll do this, the part that we had to skip past just now. Um, we'll, uh, we'll do that again on a different day and we could do more, um, more of those ones up there. Cause there's even, there's, a, there's 106 different, um, 106 statues. And if you see this is, I have this book that I got there. I have it um, and it's all mostly about the palace, but it has in it, it has this really great map. And this is what I sent to Kate. <laughs> I'll show you. It's a, uh, I had to copy it. It's two, pa two pages and it basically has a location of every one of the statues. Can you guys see that? And I sent this to her with this pencil drawing on it of, and then go here and then we'll go up here <laughs> um, because the paths are kind of crazy. But yeah, there's 106 different statues in that garden. Um, and that doesn't count all of the buildings and everything else um, in it. Um, but it's pretty cool. There's a whole, there's this, there's a whole section up here we didn't even go to. Um, and then in the center, there's tennis courts. There's also the, um, there is also the, where kids could rent ponies and ride on little Shetland ponies, which I won't even bring it up for Mother's Day today, but I used to have a Shetland pony as a child. And if I bring it up to my mother, we won't talk for six months. So that's, that's a whole story there, <laughs> but there's the, uh, there's also the little, um, the little kiosk where they have the theater and people could do, they could do puppet shows. There was a really uh, great book that came out this year called The Paris Hours, I think. And it, it's a lot of it is centered around those little, one of those little um, marionette puppets that they do. So there was some really, um, there's some really, the, the garden is huge. And then it goes all the way down, which if you did the walk when we did Montparnasse, and then we ended at Closerie de Lila. That's the park basically extends all the way up to there. They call it some, they call that a different, um, is the uh, the park of the explorers, which is like, De, or, or Marco Polo. Um, but it's, it's still kind of, most people think it's still technically the Luxembourg. So it goes all the way up to there. And if you follow that, you could go up to the um, observatory too. Um, so it's just endless. It's any, it's an endless, so. Um, oh, thanks so much, Karen. I know I love it. So um, I guess I think we lost Kate, but it's uh, we've reached an hour anyway. So I want to thank everybody for coming today and being able to check out this beautiful, amazing garden. Um, I will uh, post on on the I'll post the video and I'll post um, a list of all of the statues. So that we saw today. And if you want to have that emailed to you, send me a message um, with your email address and I could send it to you too so that you could print it up. And then when you go to Paris, um, you could go and uh, check all these things out as well. Or if you're in Paris when I am there in the fall, um, let me know and I will be doing quite a few tours. Um, then there's already a few people that are gonna be there that 
have booked some tours with me to do some different things. So um, I would love to do that with any of you guys that wanted. Um, so let me know. And thank you guys all so much. And it, have a wonderful Sunday and a weather, wonderful Mother's Day. And we'll see you guys next week. Thank you.